Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another live Q&A here on the Canadian Immigration Institute. I'm here with Alicia backman Bahari once again. How are you, Alicia? I'm doing well. It's Valentine's Day, so happy Valentine's oh, Day to everybody. It is Valentine's Day. Okay, I did know that. I did know that. In fact, my uh, my future son-in-law, my daughter's getting married on Saturday. Just before we went live, he dropped. He came by the house and dropped off something for my daughter, a little Valentine's gift and some flowers, but he was headed off to school and she's teaching. And uh, so he didn't want the flowers to go bad. So he dropped them off at our house. And so, yes, indeed, Valentine's Day, Valentine's Day. Very, very cool. So, Alicia, do you guys have anything fun planned? Well, it's not very Valentine's day -y, but we are taking off for a backcountry, cross-country ski trip tomorrow to try to get into a backcountry hut. So, yeah, we have, it's like ground zero over there with polks. Do you know what a polk is, Mark? No, I don't. Tell me. Yeah. Yeah. So the polk, my husband actually I know a polka. made his own. No, no, it's a polk. So it is <laughs> a sled that you pull behind. So there's a fixed lines that you have from the sled to a waist belt or sometimes a backpack yeah, yeah. and then okay. you can pull in your gear on because it's, it's oh, all uphill Alicia, it's uphill in that i just didn't so. know what it was called i use that when i'm hunting all the time to to there bring my my game back after i'm hunting so that's exactly it i've got a, i call it a calf sled <laughs> except i have a i have a, there's poles to keep it balanced i used to yeah. just use a rope but it was kind of a pain because the sled would go all over the place and i couldn't control it but with mm -hmm. those poles, and I actually will hook them with carabiners to the belt loops on my pants. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe that's the exact same thing you're talking about, but. A, a little bit similar. When you're skiing downhill, you need to make sure you've got enough clearance for the skis and that Good your sled's point. not going to go out okay. of control. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Awesome. Well, there we go. So yes, there's lots of fun things and uh, to do in Canada in the cold and the snow. Welcome everyone. We'd love to hear where you're tuning in from. Please don't hesitate to post uh, uh, just a little comment with your location and where you're at in your immigration journey. Um, and uh, yeah, if you know, another thing we always love to see is if we've you know done work with you in the past. If you've subscribed to one of the uh, uh, Express Entry Master Classes. There's another one coming up literally in, in uh, on the 20th to the 22nd. So next week. So they're, they're in the link, you can find the description. Um, in the description, you can find the link to the course. But if anyone who's been through any of those, we'd love for you to give shout outs. We'd love to hear how you're doing. We'd love to hear your success stories. Um, there's uh, obviously, if you speak French, boy, there's no shortage of opportunities for you. But we did have, Alicia, we just did have a round of invitations, didn't we? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't the, the Feb 13th draw from a few years ago where they scooped everybody. It wasn't that, but it was a general draw. And CRS points are still super high. So 535 was the minimum CRS for this round yesterday. And there was you know, a decent number of invitations, 1,490. Yes. So what do you think the future holds, Alicia? That's what people ask us. What does the future yeah. hold? Yeah, I mean, well, the big the big scoop was actually the French targeted draw, and that happened February 1st, and they picked 7,000 people. And of course, because it was a targeted draw, the CRS was so low, 365. Um, so my guess, if I had to gaze into a crystal ball, would be that there is probably going to be another targeted draw. So we'll see which occupation they target. Maybe we'll see a STEM draw. They did transportation. Um, they did some of the specific ones before. We haven't seen a STEM for a while, so, so maybe there will be a STEM. That's entirely possible. We'll keep our fingers crossed and see how it plays out. All right, let's see if we can just drop this headline off and let's pull some comments in. Uh, we've got V. Hey, there's a, that's a name on YouTube. I wonder how you get a single letter. Pretty impressive. So hello to, to V. Um, and then we've got Spider-Man. My friend, you need to book another consult. Okay, if someone wants to withdraw a pending work permit application without falling out of a status, would a good strate strategic strategy be to travel out of Canada and re-enter as a visitor with a visitor visa, then withdraw once re-entered? Thanks. Book a consult. I'm serious. This, this stuff you're asking is super complex, and we need to understand really what's going on and what your strategy is, my friend. So in, in this case, there is no... 
um, perfect way of approaching this in any way, shape or form. There's risks with everything. I've seen times where people have requested to withdraw um, any an application and then it's, it, you know, it, they don't even acknowledge it. And uh, the application is processed because remember, it's, it's not just a unilateral decision on your part. They can choose to ignore your request. So Alicia, I don't know if you have any other high level stuff for Spider-Man here, but. Yeah, and just high level is if you do leave and then they're processing it in the meantime and you're out of country, then that can be a problem too. But of course you don't wanna stay if you've fallen out of status. So it might be doing a restoration application. And I think you were asking about it last week and, and we were talking about making sure to do a restoration application as well. Um, one other quick thing I'll add in from some consults that I've had is that if you were in a situation where you had your status was running out, you're on a post-grad work permit, and your company did an LMIA, but you didn't get that LMIA approval back yet. So the company is waiting for that LMIA, and you're trying to get your work permit changed to an employer-specific work permit. Make sure that if you had filed a placeholder application saying, wait, 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 don't reject me until I got my LMIA decision from my company. If you get that LMIA decision from your company, make sure to go back and upload that LMIA decision. Yep. So go back to that specific web form with the little boxes, with the little paper clips that says, add a document to my file, put that LMIA decision on there, and then call another couple days later and say, please link this to my file, put a note for the officer to look at it. Because when you're in these situations where there's updates or changes in your circumstance, it's really important that you notify immigration and actually send them the updated documents. Absolutely. You know, I, I think of two recent in the last week and a half work permit applications that we rushed, like crazy rush, to get submitted. Um, one of them, we had about three weeks until the work permit was expiring, and we were actually able to get the LMIA submitted and have a file number. And as many of you are aware, maybe some of you aren't, you have the ability to do that. You have the ability to request that IRCC holds it when you have a file number. Um, because that's what's required within the actual 5710 form. But the other client was not so lucky. The employer had made some mistakes. They had done the ads improperly, which happens a lot. And the previous LMIA application had been rejected because of the ads, uh, the deficiency in ads. And Alicia and I, if you go to the Canadian Immigration Podcast, you can search it on iTunes um, or wherever you watch Spotify, wherever you listen to pod uh, your podcasts. Um, we have done since I think episode around 100, we have gone through and done a very comprehensive overview of all aspects of the LMIA process. So tell your employers to go subscribe to the podcast and listen to those episodes. But in this case, there wasn't time. So they still had another week left on the advertisements and we had no choice. So there are things that you can do to try to file that work permit application before the current ones expires. But you have to be kind of creative in how you answer the questions within the form and then provide a very detailed letter of explanation to make sure that they don't find misrepresentation in some way. Uh, because without the number, really, you can't validate the form. So I'm not even sure if IRCC will accept it. Ultimate, <coughs> ultimately, we have to do exactly as Alicia said for both of those. Once we get any decision on the LMIA, if it's approved, immediately, no hesitation, upload, attach it to the, to the file as quickly as possible. Otherwise, IRCC has no obligation to hold the application. And the moment that work permit is rejected, you must stop working. And uh, don't listen to anyone who tells you differently. If you're in any kind of a restoration period, you can't keep working. It's only if you've submitted your work permit extension before your current document expires and your current work permit expires. All right. We do have some good news here. I saw, um, let's just see here. It is from Newton. So Newton says, Hey, Mark and Alicia, thanks for all the free live videos. I finally become a PR on Monday. Let's see what I have for sounds here. Oh, I got my sounds effects turned off here. Let's see. No, not that one. There we go. That's a loud applause. Okay, we're back here. We're back with sound effects and everything. So congratulations, Newton. That is fantastic. That's awesome. All right. Um, let's see. V says, hey, Mark and Alicia, super excited. I'm 20 years old and was invited for PR only with being bilingual and worked here for a year. Had to redo the French test, but was definitely worth it. 
And this is what we're seeing, right, Alicia? Um, one thing I, uh, and I don't know if you want to talk about, uh, I've done presentations, I've done uh, live presentations, I've done them in um, online on the golden age of, of the, the Francophone immigrant, but what are your thoughts on the future of immigration for, for anyone who, who, who speaks French? Uh, I think it's a great opportunity. And at the same time, I have had a few consults and I think this is now going to be a bigger issue going forward where people who are Francophone they decide that they want to move to Quebec. And yeah. sometimes they decide that they want to move to Quebec before they file their PR application on Express Entry. Sometimes they lived in Quebec and now they're thinking about moving somewhere else. Sometimes they were in a different province, but then they got their PR and they decided to move back to Quebec. Um, be really careful with this, right? So if you are getting your invitations under Francophone and you're applying for Express Entry, it is not okay to be living in Quebec, right? You have to show that you've got a valid intent to be living in any province other than the province of Quebec. And so I'm quite sure that this is going to come back to haunt people, that if they don't realize that if they got their invitation under express entry, you cannot um, have an intention to reside in the province of Quebec. So Francophone speakers, good on you. We welcome you to any province and territory across Canada except Quebec if you're doing your express entry. Yeah, and this goes for both the federal skilled worker, the federal skilled trade, the CEC. You, in order to, to qualify, you must be able to demonstrate that you can economically establish in Canada and you intend to reside in a province other than Quebec. So that is something not to be taken lightly. And that was one of the main questions that I had at the Acadie conference in Trois-Rivières last November when I traveled out there to, to present to the uh, Quebec Immigration Lawyer Association. So yes, definitely, definitely you want to be very, very careful with that. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Uh, let's go to a few more questions. Um, okay, here's a tough one from Kevin, and maybe I'll let you try to tackle this one, Alicia. Kevin says, um, hi, Mr. Mark. Kevin, are you from the Philippines? Everyone from the Philippines always calls me Mr. Mark. I got a passport request, but I'm a ship officer on board right now and can't get off from the ship for next two months. Does IRCC grant extensions for two to three months to such le legitimate reasons? And I, I'm actually going to hit this one and, and tell you, Kevin, if you have the ability to connect with us, um, this is a real challenging situation. So Alicia, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I mean, you're going to have to try to do your best, um, but there's no guarantees that immigration is going to say, sure, that's fine. We'll just, you know, extend and delay your PR. Um, sometimes they will, but you're going to have to do some legwork to see and put in that request and say, here's my ship manifest. Here's, you know, my schedule. I'm at sea for the next two months. Here's a copy of my passport. I'm still interested in pursuing my PR application. It's just that I'm physically unable to send my passport until I get back into port. Um, and then lay all this out in a detailed explanation that you're going to upload to that the specific web form with the little boxes where you're saying that you need to update your application um, because you really don't want to miss out on getting your finalization for your permanent resident landing. So do your best to try to prove to them what's going on and why. Give them a specific date when you'll be back and then say that you can mail your passport on that date. Perfect. All right, a uh, few other little pieces. I love sharing the good news. So this one is from HM225. I'm working Alicia from Pakistan here. I received my COPER last week. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish and I wish to thank you profoundly for creating the Express Entry course as it was my go-to reference for my application. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that, that shout out. You know, Alicia, I... Um, uh, I just recorded, and I'm going to be dropping it probably this afternoon, a video right here on the Canadian Immigration Institute, as well as one I'm going to upload uh, to the Canadian Immigration Podcast. I'm going to do both. And it's essentially on the top five most common questions that are answered wrong in online forms. And the reason I can say that is because I consistently get these questions when people are confused. They book a consult and they say, in the online forum, this is what someone was saying. And I just don't know if, if it's right. 
and very frequently it isn't. So stay tuned. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, please do that. Um, but also subscribe to the uh, the podcast because I'm going to go through those top five. I'm not going to talk about them here. I don't. I won't. Uh, no spoiler. No spoilers here. But um, but yeah, the express entry course. I appreciate. Um, uh, HM225 here. I can't remember who you were. You probably attended the master classes, but it's it's wonderful. I love when people come back because there's so much free information out there that's designed to help people. But in the end, there's just no verification as to what you're being told is, is correct or not. And that's why I created the Express Entry step-by-step course. And you can see this brand new version that I created just literally um, <clears throat> December, uh, and I launched it January of this year, the Express Entry Accelerator. I changed the name because it's truly designed to fast track you knowing what to do to complete your application. And there's over 68 lessons that, um, that were, that, that I've completed and it's growing that cover all aspects. And this is an interesting one right here. I have case scenarios so people can kind of see what a successful candidate might look like, but I also took it and created a brand new lesson on francophones and how powerful French language is in securing scores that are going to push you up to, I'll pull it right up to here, push you up to these higher levels. Because even with the French language proficiency, 365, I'll bet you any money, there was a lot of Francophone uh, applicants who were drawn under this general category. Because to get up into the 535s, it's tough. And within the course itself, these case scenarios actually give some very, very realistic um, uh, scenarios that are going to be very similar to you. So each of these individual lessons has its own video. And uh, my favorite part of the whole course is the, is the document section. So mastering your documents where there's a video for just about everything. And you can see within our records of employment video, the video itself is about 25 minutes long. But you can see we have a ton of reference letters and additional resources to help you navigate your way through. So just a little shout out there for the course and you can click on the description below to register. I'd love to have you join us. All right, a couple other things here and I'm gonna pull this one up. This one is from Marlene. And Marlene says, do you know if a bylaw ticket is critical for EE? And then Marlene says, oh, I was issued a provincial offense notice for $50. We don't know what it is, Alicia. Maybe it was parking, maybe it was speeding. Um, what are your thoughts on provincial offenses and uh, whether or not it can affect an express entry application with respect to inadmissibility? Mm -hmm. So criminal inadmissibility is, is a <clears throat> complex area. It sounds like this offense was in Canada because you're saying a provincial offense. Theoretically, it could be from another country that has provinces. Um, and this is where things get a little bit complicated because if it's in Canada and it was for sure a prov provincial bylaw offense and it is not a criminal offense and you were not detained by authorities um, and you were not charged with any sort of offense that could equate to a act of parliament offense, so a federal offense, then hopefully it's not going to affect you. However, immigration often asks, specifically in their background declaration questions, were you ever charged, detained, arrested, or held? And so sometimes the answer to that question, even if it's not a criminal offense, is yeah, I was detained, right? Or yeah, I was held, and then you just talk about the bylaw offense. Sometimes if your charge was in a different, or your detention was in a different province outside of Canada, different countries have different laws and so something that is a minor offense in a foreign country and a bylaw offense even could equate to a more serious criminal charge if it happened in Canada and so this is why immigration wants to know absolutely everything and if you fail to disclose it it could be grounds for misrepresentation which is a five-year bar so I always 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 speak very carefully with my clients to go through exactly what happened, when it happened, what was the what was the offense, under what section of which legislation, and then we need to see if it would be an offense in Canada and it might need to be disclosed. Yes. All right. Um, Hardeep says, uh, hi, Mark and Alicia, happy Valentine's Day to both of you. Thank you, Hardeep. Okay, here's one from V. From your experience, do you know if it's okay to change jobs as soon as I have my COPER? Use the job offer points, but want to get out of my closed work permit situation ASAP. Yeah, and these ones are, so once you become, once you have your signed confirmation of permanent residence, either an electronic one or a physically signed COPER, 
congratulations, you're a PR. And so now you have Canadian mobility rights. You have the ability to work for whichever employer you want in whichever province or territory you want. Um, however, you know, there, there is sometimes a little bit, if you've claimed arranged employment points and you said your employer was going to continue to employ you and all of a sudden you, you jump ship the instant that you have your COPER, you know, immigration might ask you about that going forward and you're just going to have to have a good answer for what happened and why. All right. And Kevin also, we'll, we'll drop these interspersed. Romantic week kicks in. Well, I guess we... <laughs> You've got a wedding, Mark. Of course it's romantic. It is. It is romantic week. Although planning a wedding isn't romantic. It's not. And do I love to take Simba, my fearless compadre here, and, and go for long drives while the weddings are being planned? You know, yes, I do like to do that. So we'll, we'll, leave, we'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, let's see what else we have here. We're going to jump to uh, Gidiji. So... This is, I'm, I'm just going to address it just at a high level. So the Rural Northern Immigration Programs, he says, recommendation, how much time? So the processing times, we're not going to go to them, but all you have to do is go to IRCC processing times and you can pull up, uh, generally speaking, most of the processing times for the various applications. I think right now, Rural Northern Immigration Program and some of the smaller ones are probably just a little bit, um, they're, they're a little bit too nuanced to justify their own processing times. Let's just take a look, Alicia. I can't remember if there is, but the Real Northern Immigration Program is an economic program. And let's see here. Yeah, it doesn't, it's got Atlantic. It doesn't have Rural Northern. Um, when they announced the Rural and Northern Immigration Program, the expectation was that processing would be quick, um, similar to the Atlantic Immigration Program. In other words, six months. So we don't know for certain as far as timing, but here's the thing. If you're in Canada and you're going through the Rural Northern Immigration Program and you've been supported by a community, in Alberta, it's Claire's home. Other provinces have um, have communities that have been designated. Um, there's almost always an opportunity to get a work permit to allow you to continue working, which then processing time, you'd like it to go quicker. But if you're planning on living in that community, which I hope is the case, it shouldn't really make too much of a difference if your application is processed in six months or 13 months. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that at that. But when it comes to recommendation, well, most of the RNIPs are designed as a, um, as a retention policy. So you're already working in the community for an employer. You've got a track record with them. The employer is a good employer in the community. They're not just some fly-by-night operation that set up a virtual space, you know, that they rented for six months to meet the minimum residency requirements for the business in the community. Um, but the, the community is an actual really, really good uh, you know, the, the community values employers that are that are contributing and supporting. And so let's just see here. I'm going to slide this over just so that everyone, oh, let's see, I've got the wrong one I hit here. Just give me a second. We'll go here. There we go. And so Alicia's just sent this link to the Rural and Northern Immigration Pilot. And uh, community requirements and what's required are all, all laid out here. Um, you can see the communities. Yeah, yeah ahead, I just Alicia. wanted to highlight at the top what's happening is some people might be a little bit worried about will we get a recommendation letter in time before the deadline and so they just have this we've extended the community recommendation period so that's what I wanted to highlight people have up until July this year mm -hmm. and then if you want to submit your application then you can still submit it up until August but you've got to get that in so that they can do a recommendation before July. Yes and you can see this is a pilot. And I've never seen to this stage a pilot that does not become a permanent program. Now, it's, it's possible, but with everything that the minister has said, both Fraser and Miller, and everything that IRCC has held to, there is a big push to, to, to rural. And so, I, I, and, and even when, Alicia, we did that special presentation with in Claire's home, uh, some of the officers that were really pro, like driving this program in, in Ottawa came out um, and uh, and shared their thoughts. And I got no sense that there was any inclination for, on the part of the government to disband this program. But unless there's some concerns about fraud or something like that, uh, even though we have these, these deadlines, um, I'd be very surprised if they didn't extend it. But it's, it's always possible. What, what have you heard, Alicia? No, it was just the same thing that um, when we talked to those officers, they said that any pilot program needs to have 
kind of a review and verification process. So they get the data. So they have officers that go out to those communities, liaise with the community, um, representatives who are in the thick of these things. And then they get feedback that's sent back to the federal government about how well this is working, what are their retention rates, how many people are staying in the communities. And as long as that's going well, then there ought to be grounds for them to extend this program. Yes. So we'll hold out, you know, we'll hold out uh, some hope that it will be extended. And I think that's probably going to be the case. All right. Well, we're interspersing, you know, Valentine's comments with the substantive questions. Amy says, happy Valentine's Day to the whole team. Hopefully the Canadian government too will show some love and enhance the cost of living conditions. Well, <laughs> I don't know exactly what you mean by enhancing the cost of living conditions, but Clearly, everything is more expensive than it was, you know, a year ago, two years ago. Inflation is a reality here in our country and, and the cost of finding accommodation, even for my daughter, Jessica, and her, her fiance, Seth, we really struggled here in Lethbridge to find something that was available that was relatively affordable. But, uh, you know, compared to Toronto, I'm not going to try to compare it, but they did find a little bedroom suite that was $1,250, which in Lethbridge is is really high for Lethbridge. I'm sure it's dirt cheap if it was in Toronto, but for a young couple who's just starting out, boy, even that cost, which used to be probably eight, maybe eight, nine hundred dollars for that type of a, a bedroom, you know, a basement suite. And understand this isn't a big basement. This is kind of like someone who just barely did what they needed to to make it a legal suite. Um, uh, definitely not fancy, old area, old home, um, but it's a place for them. So I know lots of people are struggling with those realities and even our own Prem moved from Lethbridge up to Calgary to try to find a place. If those of you who've booked consultations with us will have had an opportunity to connect with Prem at some point. Um, and they struggled a lot for their family to find a place up in Calgary. So yes, these are realities, Amy. And hopefully changes, you know, that the, the, our, our government is trying to institute will have effect and, and it will create more housing and opportunities, but only time will tell. All right. Uh, Shital says, hi, I actually wanted to ask if my experience during graduation in India is considered for express entry. And I'll little, a little teaser, I guess. This question is one of my top five questions that's going to be in, in the, the most commonly misunderstood um, questions on forums. Uh, Alicia, do you want to shed some light on this? So mm -hmm. I think what she's there's, asking is work experience while studying, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a big difference between work experience while studying outside Canada and work experience while studying inside Canada. So as long as you're studying outside Canada and you're working and you can prove that it's a high skilled NOC, so the National Occupation Classification Code is 0, 1, 2, or 3, and you can get your proof of employment from your employer and pay stubs showing that you are paid for that job, then you can claim that as high skilled foreign work experience, even if you are a full-time student. However, the rules are very different if you're inside Canada. So keep in mind that if you are on a study permit and you are a full-time student in Canada, you cannot claim work experience while you're a full-time student in Canada. So those are the big differences. All right. Next question is from Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer says, hey, Mark and Alicia, can I apply for a bridging open work permit after submitting my express entry application and entering the express entry pool? Pool being operative term here. So mm -hmm. can you... Yeah, and Jennifer, we talk about this one lots too. So be very, very, very careful. You can't submit a bridging open work permit if you've only entered the express entry pool. So if you have a profile sitting in the pool, meaning that you, know, you have a CRS score, but you do not have an ITA yet. So the thing that needs to happen before you could be eligible for a bridging open work permit would be that you have an express entry profile, you get an invitation to apply, and you have to have submitted your complete EAPR within your 60-day deadline. Only after you submit your complete EAPR and you've passed the completeness check can you then submit that bridging open work permit application. And sometimes, depending on the category of work permit you had, sometimes it's not an open work permit. Sometimes you're doing a bridging closed work permit and a lot of people get tripped up on this and it can completely ruin your ability to continue working. So if you're in this situation, please book a consult. Yes. 
All right, here's a, a, an interesting question here from um, Habamana, Jean. I got an ITA for French language proficiency under CEC, but I've not yet completed a one-year experience. Can IRCC consider my eligibility for FSW as my CRS scores more than the 365? So this is one that I'll address. So I'm assuming whenever you receive an ITA, uh, many people, excuse me, are eligible under the CEC and the Federal Skilled Worker Program. And, uh, but because of the way when you answer your questions in the, in the work history section, they, they round it up by month. Um, so it's possible for individuals to not yet have met that year threshold, whether it's the first year, second year, and have their CRS rounded up. Now, I'm going to point something out here. This happens commonly when people are eligible under the Federal Skilled Worker Program, but yet IRCC, when they're doing the assessments and the calculations, give more credit or they give more work history time than, let's say the person has only worked 11 months, but it's their current employment and they've listed it as their current occupation in their profile. Well, after they roll over the 11 month mark, sometimes IRCC rounds it up to a full year. So in that case, totally legitimate, it happens. But for other people who do not have eligibility under the Federal Skilled Worker Program, there's no way you should be even in the pool if you don't have that one year. Because at some point when you're answering the questions in that little IRCC wizard that, you know, that you answer and then it, populates your ability to, to start your profile, it says, do you have one year of work experience? And so you would have had to say no. So, mm, but Habimana here, Gene, the reality is you can proceed forward. It is possible. So I wish IRCC would just release this in a policy directive or in their completeness check or whatever it might be, the A11.2 assessment, wherever their policy is found, I wish they would just state this. But repeatedly in numerous meetings that I've been over the years with IRCC, sitting on panels for Express Entry with um, uh, conferences, things like that, the reality is they've told us if you are drawn early and it is your current occupation that you're working in, then just wait until you've met the full year before you submit your EAPR and you will be okay. All right. So don't rush and submit it before you hit the one year. And we're talking about getting an ITA and submitting your EAPR. You've got 60 days to file. So hang tight. Wait till you've actually accumulated the full one year and then submit your application and you should be just fine, Jean. Alicia? Yeah, and you probably, yeah, you probably want to add to your letter of explanation too, mm -hmm. to say, look, I was invited under CEC. I didn't have my full 52 weeks until this week. I waited until after I had my full 52 weeks to submit my EAPR. I should meet all the minimum eligibility criteria under FSW. So you're going to have to lay all this out and just explain it carefully to make sure that you're not misrepresenting and you're not trying to submit that application too early. So you'll, you'll need to carefully manage your timing to have all your police checks, to have all your documentations that are still valid, so nothing expires before your deadline, but that you have those 52 weeks fully accumulated and you can prove that. Exactly. Happy Valentine's Day, Alexa. Oh, do you know what? I think I actually have something, Alicia. Oh, I thought I did. Maybe I don't. Oh, there it is. There it is. We do have some hearts falling from the sky. <laughs> All right. Happy Valentine's Day to you too, Alexa. Okay. Here's a question from Rajesh. He says, hello, Mark. Does work experience with open work permit count towards PR points? This is a little bit of a loaded question because points follow two different paths sometimes. Does pursuing an LMIA still beneficial? Is it still worth it? So Rajesh, I, I created a whole little explainer video on this. So when can you claim arranged employment points? And I have an explainer video on it, and I also have a very detailed blog on our website. So an article that goes through the scenarios when you can properly claim arranged employment. And it's tricky. Usually you cannot claim arranged employment unless you have been working on a work permit for over a year, or your employer is going to go and it's got to be an employer specific work permit, not an open work permit, or your employer is going to go and do an LMIA. So either a new LMIA or you've been added to that LMIA. So be very careful. Um, can you claim CRS for a job offer? Go check out the video. 
I have a very detailed explanation with a little bit of um, explainer kind of slides in the background. And there's also, I think, a link to our blog article on our website. Looks like I'll probably get a little ad popping up there, but you can see this one has been quite popular. It's been over 12,000 people, Alicia, that have looked at your, your video here on job offers and CRS points. So um, yeah, so I just paused it before the ad started kicking in. But anyways, oh, there we go. There you go. So go check this one out, guys. Great. That was a great video, actually, Alicia. Really, really effective, really popular. Okay, next here is the sock spot. And so this is a little bit more of a comprehensive question, but um, we see this happen a lot as a strategy for people to, to stay in Canada. And I can tell you that these options are going to be limited in the future because IRCC is just cracking down on it. And they feel like people are, are not following the, the, true, um, the true purpose, the fundamental purpose for some of these temporary programs and that they're being used to kind of skirt around to, to pursue other pathways. In other words, PR. So the sock spot says, does the principal foreign national apply um, if one attempts to transition from a study permit and a spousal open work permit to where the initial spouse receives a closed work permit and initial student wants to get a, a spousal open work permit based on closed work permit. So <laughs> Alicia. So for anybody who's confused, the strategy in the past was, let's say there's a husband and a wife. The husband gets the study permit and the wife gets the open spousal work permit. And then the wife says, now I'm going to get the study permit. And then the husband gets the open spousal work permit or whatever, whatever uh, um, incarnation you want of those kind of factors. The problem now is that IRCC has said they are no longer allowing open spousal work permits in situations where somebody is studying other than at the graduate or master's level. So those open spousal work permits generally are now only going to be available if your spouse gets into a master's program or a PhD program. Perfect, perfect. Okay, I'm going to pull one up, a follow-up, because this is right in line with what we're talking about, Francophone immigration. So Jean says, hey, I'm in Quebec. I don't have any ties to anywhere else. I got an ITA under French. Now what do I do? How do I show this intention uh, to reside um, in, in in another province, not in Quebec. Well, there's only one thing we'll do, which is, we won't do that one. This one here, we'll ring the bell and, and tell you, look, you should book a consult so we can canvas this with you. Um, it's complex and the expectation and onus is on you to be able to prove. Now, when you file your EAPR application, we always try to load up those justifications at the front end. I never want to wait <clears throat> until an officer comes back and says, provide evidence that you're actually going to leave because all of your ties are in Quebec, your work, your, <clears throat> if applicable, <clears throat> excuse me, your study, everything else is, is all tied to Quebec. So objectively, I don't see you having any intention of living anywhere but Quebec. So Alicia, I don't know if you have any higher level thoughts on this. Yeah, and I've, I've helped a number of clients through the situation where they studied, they went to school in Montreal, and they had their first job in Quebec, and they have their rental in Quebec, and their license is in Quebec. And I said, no way, you got to move. You got to show that you have a valid intention, that you're going to be taking a job outside of Quebec, that you have a rental lined up for a long-term lease to be physically moving to Quebec have all those things ahead of time, open a bank account in another province, show that you are going to actually take steps to move outside of Quebec. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right, let's jump to our next question. This one is from, let's see here, get back on track here. Okay, this one's Pevneet. Hi, Mark, what kind of, and this is one I'm not quite sure, Pevneet, if I fully understand your question, but you said, what kind of ADR, additional document request, we get uh, for employer location, when can we expect after submitting an application? So I don't know, Alicia, I, I, I was, th this relates specifically to express entry, which is an important component or provincial nominee programs, but it's economic PR, one that I wanted to address. But as far as employer location, I'm not quite sure what uh, Pavneet could be alluding to. Do you know? So my guess is that they updated express entry to require Postal codes. Postal codes. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you have to now have postal codes and some people who didn't have to have the postal codes may be getting additional document requests saying, wait a minute, you know, where's your employer located? Where's your place of employment? And this can open up a whole can of worms. So I think the reason that they updated for postal codes was because some people were being a little bit fast and loose about where they were physically working. And this has implications and trickle down effects for work permits, for LMIAs, for employer compliance under the IMP. So if you have a work permit and, oh, Mark, I wish the border officers are listening to this podcast. I wish that they would understand how important it is for the border officers when people come with an LMIA or an employer portal offer of employment and the company is clearly said, we've got branch offices, this person will be needing to work in I don't know, Vancouver and in another city in BC, plus do field work, that it's so important for the applicant, for the person who has the work permit and for the company, that that is properly noted on the work permit. So if on your work permit, it says location of work is Vancouver, and that's all it says, and there's no remarks, and it doesn't say that you're authorized to work anywhere in BC, that can be a very real problem because you could be working without authorization. The company could be liable for employing you without authorization, which is a criminal offense. And you can get your express entry refused for illegal work. So this is something that you've got to be very, very careful about. Go back, check what your work permit says as your employment location. If there's a remark at the bottom that says authorized to work at, you know, employer client sites across the province, that's great. That's what you need. But be very careful about your location of work because sometimes people try to say, especially for provincial nominee categories, they try to say, oh, the head office is in Calgary, right? Or the head office is in Toronto. So let's just say that I'm working in Toronto, even though they are working at a branch location that's not in that city. So this can become um, a very real reason to worry about misrep or potential illegal work. So if this is happening, I would suggest you book a consult. Exactly. And with those consults, oh, I've got to adjust my my little buttons here. I've got them mixed up. Um, With the consultation, remember you guys, it's really easy. All you have to do is just go to our firm website and right at the top here, there's speak to a lawyer, book an immigration consultation. You can click on here and then go and book the consultation the length of time that you need. Understand that with our consultations, okay, this isn't a situation where we take 20 minutes to listen to you tell your story. We send you intake forms where you give us everything in advance. And when we jump on the call with you, we're ready to share insight. So I I recently had um, an email from someone who was referred from another lawyer and they said, well, the, or I can't remember if it was a consultant, I can't remember who it was, but they said, well, the previous consult we had was the same price as yours, but was for an hour. And, um, and, and so do you offer, you know, discounted rates? And I said, no. And the reason is Alicia and I've been practicing for 20 years. And what will often take, and, and a consult doesn't mean anything. What is a consult? A consult is an opportunity for us to share insight, direction, and advice. But it doesn't always translate that way when you're booking consults with other people. If the person doesn't have the answers on the spot, then you're not going to get much out of that consultation. And I hope that you guys have seen from what Alicia and I do here in these live Q&As that we know a little bit about immigration. And when it comes time for the consultations, the fees that we charge are set at that rate because of the value that comes. So I just wanted to point that out and it's super easy. All you have to do is click on the the time uh, spot that you want and then you choose the time that works for you. Alicia is a very busy beaver this week and so she doesn't have any availability this week for consultations. But I strongly encourage you, um, if you can't get into Alicia, uh, or myself, there's Igor, or um, we've got we've got options for you. And if there's a really urgent matter, you can always reach out to us. And I'm not sure if I have the actual, yeah, I think I do here. Um, you can send an email right here to info at holthylaw.com. If you have a really urgent matter and you can't find a, an appointment time, We usually do try to accommodate people. Um, Either myself or Igor or Alicia is almost always available to help in urgent situations. So you can send an uh, an email to info at holthylaw.com. Talk to Prem and make your appeal. And uh, then we'll decide if, if we can accommodate you. 
All right. And another thing I want to point out, Alicia, too, with the work that we do with our clients, I tell people repeatedly when they're deciding whether or not to retain us. Within our firm, we have a special way of working with, with our clients. Um, we are really, really keen on allowing our clients to maintain, maintain control over their applications while at the same time getting direct access to us as experienced immigration lawyers. And we don't use assistants or paralegals uh, as your main point of contact. The reality is you speak directly with us. And with that model, we only have the capacity to take on so many clients. And Alicia and myself and Igor, we refuse to take new clients on if it is going to prejudice the clients we're currently working with. So um, we never take on more than we can handle. And that is the difference. So where some firms will just keep on taking people in and then just say, oh, it's just taking longer to process your application. No, that's not us. So I just want to give that little bit of a, a little bit of a shout out. All right. Um, okay, Hardeep, I will answer your question. He says, we applied Nova Scotia non-express entry on November 2022. So we are about a year, 13, 14, we're about 15 months, I guess. Is that right? I think. Could be the end of November that he applied. Outland, but still after medical, no answer from IRCC. What should we do? Well, the answer is pretty simple, my friend. You are in a situation where the processing times, if we go right here and I pulled these up, they're at 13 months, but this is average processing times all over the world. So if you are applying from a country where there are higher volumes, then you can expect that the processing, processing times are going to be higher. And it does not take an officer very long to process an application once it's actually sitting on their desk. So you may not hear anything for a long period of time. And then all of a sudden, boom, you start getting notifications that it's moving forward. So it's not unusual. And these are an average for a global average for provincial nominees. And your visa office that's servicing your country may very well just be slower because of the volume. And uh, so keep that in mind. And, and there's nothing unusual, I guess, in terms of how long your application's been in the queue. It's, you know, that's entirely normal for it to be a few months, a few months older. Alicia, any, any other thoughts? No, I mean, the average processing times are here hopefully right around the time where you should get a decision pretty soon. And as long as you have completed everything on your biometrics instruction letters, your medical instruction letters, and you've responded, um, you know, hopefully everything's in the queue and waiting to be processed there. Yes. Nisarj says, hey, Mark and Alicia, I was just wondering if there is any hope for 497 general draw. And I think, um, you know, it's not going to drop down to that level, I do not believe, for a long period of time. If you look at all the general draws, 535, so we went from January 31st, when we did the, the, a previous general draw, and then we went to February the 13th, which is really only two weeks, um, and it was a slightly larger draw, it really did not go down substantially. So 541 to 535, six points. Um, and you can see even before that, when we went the week before, when there was a larger 1,000, 543. So the, the reality is we do expect it to start coming down a little bit, but to get down all the way to um, 497, they'd have to do a series of large draws of you know 4,000 or plus. Mm -hmm. And one thing you can look at too is how many people are sitting in the range. So there's a lot of people when you go down and look at the range of applicants right now that are sitting in that high 490s range. Mm -hmm. All right. I keep refreshing it too, Alicia, because I'm, I'm trying to see, is there going to be another round of invitations? Is there possible that uh, one could pop up right while, we're doing, while, while we are doing our live right now? And it has happened in the past. Um, but right now, as of February 13th yesterday, that was the draw. And like Alicia said, if we look at February, as of February the 11th, so there were people that still piled in even after this, um, this is the range that you're looking at. So you can see over 500, like this is, this is pretty crazy, 9,000. So that's how many were in the pool, you know, and basically almost 10,000 were above 500 before this draw, which only took about 1,500 people. So and then that there's 7,000 above 491. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. And even, even in 491, there's another 7,000. So scores are still skyrocket high and immigration clearly does not have an, uh, a desire to do large rounds of invitations right now. They've all been fairly small, except for 
the category based draw. <laughs> All right, let's zip through a few last ones. We've got about five minutes left. Um, Alexander says, I got five in my IELTS general reading, which is so common. Reading is tricky. Actually, writing is, is almost one of the more tricky. I find it really interesting, Alexander, that you got a five uh, in, in reading, but you got seven and seven and eight in your other abilities. Um, I'm not eligible for express entry. No, not with that. Um, not if you're going through the Federal Skilled Worker Program. Um, can I apply for the PNP? Can I redo my reading test? Alicia, what do you think? Yeah. Starting position is, yeah, redo the reading test, right? Mm -hmm. Study. Really try your best to get a, a seven, if you can, in your reading. And there are some resources. Mark did a great podcast with trying to talk about strategies for increasing your scores when you're writing these tests by studying. And there's CELPIP or IELTS, so you could try both. Yes. And I'm just trying to see here. I'm not sure if it's, yes. Okay, I want to show you. This is a great segue uh, to just give a shout out to Igor. So you can see this is the, the live that Alicia, and this is our Canadian Immigration Institute. Um, so if you look here, you'll see that Igor has coming up here on the 15th uh, of literally tomorrow, he has Mastering the self it all you need to know about the test. So they are... Uh, him and I Igor and, um, oh, I can't remember what her name is, directly from CellPip are going to be doing a series of tutorials on improving, you know, how to improve your CellPip scores. So, you know, this one's succeeding in listening, writing, uh, sorry, reading, writing, and speaking. So a series of five, and they're all scheduled uh, over the next, uh, the next month or so here. So please, please, if you haven't, click on this to get notified. And, uh, and then it's going to start at 10 a.m. tomorrow right here on the Canadian Immigration Institute YouTube channel and across our other platforms. So great resource. Please take advantage of it because this is the CellPip's very own uh, instructor that is, uh, that is offering these tips and strategies. So there's no better source than to go right to the organization itself for strategies on improving and scoring higher. And keep in mind that immigration allows you to choose which test you submit mm -hmm. so whichever one you've scored best in overall that's going to give you the maximum points that's the one you pick yeah and we also know that there is now a third version that has has come live and it is called the pearson test um and let me just see if i can make sure i've got the the proper website here there's so many people trying to corner the the market on it um and while okay, you do I'll that just, mark mm -hmm. Too, I did want to mention, so yes, for some PNP programs, a five in one of the categories will allow you to apply for the PNP, mm -hmm. but usually you have to be eligible under the CEC categories, and you usually have to have some sort of employer-sponsored program for that PNP. So sometimes PNPs, but usually you have to be already living and working or have a job offer from an, a, an employer that's based in that province. Yes. So this is an interesting thing here. They're making some pretty bold claims here, faster, fairer, and simpler. Well, we'll see. It takes time, and, and you could literally write tests with each of the, the, the organizations, IELTS, CELPIP, or the PTE, and um, take whichever one is best and use it. So take that into consideration. Okay, let's wrap up with a few last questions. Um, okay, this is a huge issue, you guys, huge issue. And this is why I keep coming back to the benefits of retaining a firm, our firm to help you because we drill this into our clients not to fall into this trap. Um, sometimes when you're filling it in quick, you just don't remember. But when you've got somebody else watching for you, you know, really looking out for you to make sure you're, you're protected from yourself, um, that is, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's just dive in here. So Dur uh, Durga says, um, I'm from Nepal. Unfortunately, I received a PFL from IRCC. I forgot to mention my previous visa refusal. Two from Australia and one from USA. Any chance for success? Alicia, aside from uh, this, booking yeah. a consult. Really, really, really book a consult. Um, you don't have a lot of time to respond either. So usually they give you tight timelines on responding to the procedural fairness. If they think that you're misrepresenting, you can get a five-year bar. You can be prevented from filing any sort of application to Canada and not able to enter the country, and that's going to go on your immigration record, um, your account. They will see that you were barred from misrep in the past. If there is a really legitimate reason, 
or if you can definitely say, you know, here are all the details for these refusals. Here's what happened. Here's why I said this. Take responsibility, take accountability for it. Say, I was wrong. I should have said this. Here's why I was refused. Here are the details of everything. Please, 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 I am so sorry. Um, you know, I, I want to fully explain my past and why I didn't disclose these visa refusals. You might have a chance, right? It's all you can do. You just have to be honest and you have to provide them with all the information. Um, and at least if you're honest and you come forward and you come clean, there's a risk that maybe they just refuse your PR and they don't slap you with a misrep finding as well. Um, and that would be better than having a five-year misrep bar against you. So, you know, you've got to be honest, you've got to disclose, you've got to provide the evidence that they're looking for. Exactly. All right, last question, and we'll finish off strong with Express Entry. Ink Tattoo says, hey, Mark and Alicia, can we include paid vacation periods in calculating the one year of work experience? Yeah, and IRCC has some policy guidance on this, and usually they say, as long as it's a reasonable vacation period and as long as you're paid, yes. If you're trying to say, oh, I was paid for, you know, eight weeks of vacation and you're outside of the country, probably that's going to be an issue. But if you're gone for one or two weeks and otherwise you have the full 52 weeks, usually that's going to be okay. Um, but always the onus is on you to prove that you're meeting those requirements for Canadian work experience or your high skilled work experience. Perfect. All right, we want to, as always, give a shout out to, <clears throat> to one of our sponsors, Journey Business Plans. If you have ever um, considered coming to Canada where a business plan is going to help with your immigration application, these guys are the way to go. They've been a great sponsor of our podcast. And if you go to our website here, you will see that we have blog and resources. Please do not um, fail to connect here Go to our blog post and look at all of the topics that we have. Um, you know, we try to release an ep a new pod, uh, sorry, a new blog post whenever there's some new announcement from immigration. If we haven't done it there, um, we also will uh, remember we have our Canadian Immigration Podcast. And like I said before with Alicia, um, starting at episode 100, we start to really focus in on um, business immigration, the temporary foreign worker program all the ins and outs, uh, the International Mobility Program, and we're working our way through. The last one we released is the Canada-Chile Free Trade Agreement, and we've got, uh, you can see all the other ones. The GATS we talked about. I did an episode on C10, Significant Benefit Work Permits. So check these things out, and um, uh, yeah, there's a, a ton of resources and assistance here. But we're going to have the top five common, commonly answered uh, questions, commonly wrong answered questions on immigration forums that one i'm going to be dropping shortly so please do check that out and finally the express entry accelerator 2024 brand new course chock full of all brand new videos all brand new content uh, as i indicated before this is the actual course you can see there's over 68 individual lessons that walk you through everything from mastering the basics determining if you're eligible um, completing your profile even and it's all broken down to principal applicants, uh, accompanying spouses. So if you're a principal, you don't need to watch the lessons on accompanying spouses, right? You can skip that. This is why it's literally on demand. And uh, and then finalizing your profile, completing your EAPR. This one takes us a lot of time to generate because this is the real EAPR, which requires us to have access to a client's um, real you know, EAPR uh, in order to do these videos. And, uh, you know, it's, um, and so there's a lot of redacting of information, but this is exactly how it's structured. And there's a section, excuse me, <coughs> boy, <I> sneeze, <clears throat> a section for principal applicants for accompanying spouses and dependent children. And if you keep going through here, uh, a section on document checklists, mastering your documents, every single document here, there's even more that are not even listed there. Um, there's two pages of, 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 of documentation you can see here. And if we jump back here to our modules, uh, to our section here, um, as you go through each of these, we even have at the very end, a member resource section that is constantly being built out with separate videos, blog posts. You can see we've got some that Alicia has done previously, um, work history, language assessments, eligibility, dependence, job offers, and this is constantly 
growing and expanding as new information comes out. So if you want to subscribe and join me, the first masterclass starts literally on Monday of next week. I think that's the 20th. And uh, yeah, it's going to be, I think that's, yeah, next week. It's going to be, it's going to be great. And uh, every day we have a new one hour masterclass session. So hopefully you guys can join, click on the link below and you can connect in. All right, Alicia, another fantastic uh, day and lots. We appreciate the, uh, we appreciate your appreciation. So, so Jack Wu, um, we hope that this information is helpful and there's a reason we do it. You guys, we do it because it's hard to get no uh, noticed in a noisy world. You know, when there's so many people clamoring for your attention, we hope that you can feel and, and, and really come to understand that we're here to help you. And, uh, that from the answers we give that we can build that relationship of trust. That's so essential. Anytime you choose to connect with someone for assistance with your immigration. All right, that is about all that I've got for today, Alicia. Um, thank you, everybody, for connecting in. And we will leave you once again with some tunes. All right, guys, take care. We'll see you around next time here on the Canadian Immigration Institute.